right, so the correct answer here is A. So all of the light that's within the sun ultimately comes from the core, from nuclear fusion in the core. But we can't see that light directly because for one thing, it has to work its way out. But for another thing, um, anything that's below the photosphere is too dense to allow light to escape. So it's like you're, you're too far inside the crowd and it's only when you reach the edge of the crowd that you can actually escape and walk away freely. So same thing with the photons. Um, they have to make it all the way to the photosphere before the atoms are far enough apart to allow the light to escape. All right, so I wanna um, look in a little bit more detail at the solar atmosphere. And the three layers are the photosphere, which is the source of all the photons that we can see. Um, the chromosphere, which is a hot and less dense region, which glows red. And then the corona, which is actually the hottest layer of the atmosphere, um, even thinner and uh, very difficult to image except during a solar eclipse. So first um, we discussed the photosphere already. The chromosphere is mostly observed during eclipses as well. And when we observe the chromosphere, uh, we see a red glow and this is from the hydrogen alpha line. So when we talked about um, spectroscopy, hydrogen has one strong red line and several kind of blue purple lines. That strong red line is the hydrogen alpha line. And because the sun has so much hydrogen in it, that's the color that we see in the chromosphere. So the chromosphere also has spicules, which are kind of jets of gas that erupt out through the photosphere into the chromosphere every few minutes. So there's you know, more gas being added slowly to the, that chromosphere um, over time. Okay, so thinking about the photosphere and the type of light we measure, and then the chromosphere and what it, it uh, actually appears like on the last slide, what type of spectrum would you think we would see from each of these layers? So thinking back to um, the types of, I guess, materials that produce each kind of spectrum, the absorption spectrum comes from light from a hot source passing through a cool gas, but an emission spectrum comes from a hot excited gas that's directly emitting light. And that's the case with the chromosphere. Um, it's a, a thin gas, but it's hot. So it's um, even hotter than the photosphere, which seems strange. The temperature as you dive into the sun gets warmer as you go in, but if you're starting from the photosphere and going out, it also gets hotter until it levels off at the uh, corona. So the chromosphere as a result is hot and glows. And since it's mostly made of hydrogen, it glows red. Um, but why does the photosphere produce an absorption spectrum instead of a continuous spectrum? The photosphere is actually thin enough that its atoms are able to absorb the light that's coming through. So even though there's, there's a continuous spectrum that's um, kind of behind the photosphere, the photosphere is thin enough that it's able to, it's cool enough that it can actually absorb some of that light. So it would be a continuous spectrum if the um, gas molecules in the photosphere were not cool enough to actually absorb some of the light. But they do absorb some of the light, so we see an absorption spectrum. So like I mentioned before, the photosphere is kind of the coolest region on the sun. And then from there, the chromosphere is hotter. And then the temperature spikes up really fast in this transition region before it levels off in the corona. So the transition region, the reason for this huge temperature increase is not really well understood. It might have to do with the strong magnetic field in that region that's ionizing um, the atoms there. So it, ripping the electrons off of those atoms. Uh, but truly, this is not well understood and one of the reasons that NASA has sent the Parker Solar Probe, which is, I think right now, orbiting within the corona. Okay, the corona um, is something that we see, you know, it's associated with solar eclipses because it's really hard to see in, in, at any other time. Uh, but when the moon blocks the sun during a solar eclipse, then you can see these kind of wispy tendrils of gas. The corona extends far from the sun and uh, is the source of also the solar wind. Um, it's hotter than the chromosphere and because it's so hot, it has a lot of ions. And so its absorption spectrum is really complicated. It contains things like iron with only 13 electrons instead of the normal 26. So that's like a super ion. Um, so the, the study of things like this, the, the spectra of layers of the sun 
that's what helped us to actually identify some elements that we didn't know about before we started doing spectroscopy. So we measured, for example, helium in the sun before it was even discovered anywhere on Earth. So the solar wind um, is basically parts of the corona that are um, escaping. So these are generally charged particles, protons and electrons that are carried along the sun's magnetic field. They're light and hot and they are moving quickly enough to escape the sun's gravity. The sun is losing 2 million tons a second to the solar wind, but don't worry, that's not actually very much when you look at the entire mass of the sun. So in 2017, some of you may recall, there was a total solar eclipse across the United States. And it was probably one of the peak experiences of my life. Um, if you ever have the chance to see a total solar eclipse, I very much recommend it. Um, and prior to the solar eclipse, you know, this is kind of a natural experiment because the, you know, we can make models of the sun. And so this is a model of the solar corona that's based on what we know about the sun's magnetic field and our entire model of what goes on in the sun's interior. And now we have a natural experiment to actually measure it and see if our observations line up with our predictions. So beautiful natural experiment. This is the model. And as we kind of drag this slider across, we can see how the observations actually fit the model to a very large part. So even though some of the details are different, the general shape of this solar corona is as predicted. And this is great because it means that our understanding of the sun's magnetic field is on the right track. So even though there's still plenty that we do not understand, um, we are, uh, have actually made a great deal of progress into being able to uh, predict the shape of the corona. And this isn't just important for, you know, I guess the enterprise of science, but also because understanding the sun's magnetic field and how it changes over time is related to solar activity and space weather.